My name is Jeff Bennett. I was born in Birmingham, England on the 24th of February 1924. And uh, when did you, uh, what, can you remember what, what the first motorcycle you ever rode was? My first motorcycle I ever rode was a, was a 500cc Jap Cotton, which I bought for two and sixpence with three friends in 1936. And we, we had those, kept that in the allotments. You know what allotments are, do you? No. Oh, the allotments are where, where, where you have gardens and stuff? That's something? right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we've learned to ride this thing. Oh, we had fun and games for two months. One day we went and the bloody thing had been stripped down and so we pinched the engine. <laughs> so that, was, that was it. The, the, is that the type of bike that you just recently bought? No, no, no the one I bought was the uh, 1926 350 uh, reserve TT machine. Big oh, yeah. tires outside for the Blackbird engine. Uh -huh. uh, the one you had was a what again? The, two, uh, the one I rode in. Well, I first bought we were chill kids with a, a cotton with a 500 cc overhead valve, uh, which was a, a jack engine. Uh, let me see. How did you get into the racing? Well, right, uh, having been in the army for five years during the war, uh, the war finished in Italy, where I've been for the last three and a half years. And what were you doing there? I was a signals dispatch rider. Which meant you were. Uh, which I'd go all over the darn place taking messages. Huh. Very, very interesting it was. On what kind of a motorcycle? Uh, that was on a BSA M20, 500 side valve. Okay. Amongst other machines, I rode with a 68 side valve Norton and a 350 overhead valve Triumph. All army bikes, excellent. Okay. Uh, and then the army decided, when the war finished, thousands of troops were floating around, so they decided to give them sport. And Speedway started them, which I found most interesting. Yeah. And uh, I built a bike up, and I was just a natural. Uh, within a month, I was, I held most of the track records, which was at Bolfetta, San Spolito, Bombolo in Naples, and uh, I don't Bolfetta, Bolfetta, San Spolito, Trani and Naples. Was it was it a dangerous job, the, the dispatch riding? Or no, not if you were sensible. It could be here. It could be <laughs> the roads weren't obviously very good because in condition. The mud in the winter and the Italian. The big, think about Italy being a sunny country. My God, in '43 it rained so much we all got bugged down. Our artillery were bugged down on the east coast at Vasto, and the roads were. A quagmire, but the old M20, she survived, and you, 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 you learned to be a, a damn good trial rider, actually. Mm -hmm. But you weren't riding through uh, uh, exploding shells. Oh no, we went that far up. We were about 20 miles behind the front. We were, we were, we were, we had a, a cushy job. Okay. When we, when they started, when they first thought about the racing, uh, the British, of course, were always very good at grass track racing. And the first racing in Italy was held on the Faggia Manfredonia Road in southern Italy. It was a, a, a grass trap on the side of a hill. And the Americans saw this, they said, well, we'll like to compete with you. And uh, when they turned up, we all laughed ourselves silly because they arrived with foot clutch Harley Davidsons, weighing about 15 tons each, at least appeared to be 15 tons each of machinery. And, uh, our boys had all ridden on the grass before. I was a spectator in those days, and I watched them, watched the hill, they had these performances, the Harleys on this thing. They couldn't, when they went down the hill, they went straight on. They couldn't turn the corners. And of course, it was a farce. How the Italian, how the Americans rode those bikes in trust country, I do not know, because uh, they were just like a, a tank on two wheels. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, after the after the uh, the war or, or after Italy, then you went back. To England. I came back to England. Uh, actually, what happened? Wembley Speedway asked me to go and see them, um, and I went down to see them. And they said, "Well, when you get out of the army, uh, you know, we'd like to sign you up." That was Wembley Speedway. In the meantime, Birmingham, 
we're starting up again, and, uh, and I thought, well, Birmingham is my hometown, and Mr. Marshall, who was the promoter, asked me to uh, go and see him, which I did. And he said, well, would you like a trial at Bristol, which I did, and I was very successful. And I signed up immediately. What, what was the, the what was the situation? In, in, was it a new a, a new sport, or was it? Oh no, very old, very old. Speedway started uh, in Australia in, in just after the First World War. Uh, it went to the States, uh, and then Britney started really, very really busy back 1928. So how was the circuit, what, what sort of a circuit was it, if you were on the Speedway circuit? The Speedway circuit roughly was, for, they, they, the tracks varied from 300 yards to 440 yards. Originally they were made of cinder, uh, two long straights and two nice, oh, two nice turns, both ends. What kind of vehicle? Uh, all all, all J.O. Crispic engines, uh, frames, we used, we, we used old rudge frames. Uh, not rudge, but they were, they were rudge, but they were designed for speedway. And then they started whitening the machines, and they altered the head stuck. There were no bearings in the head, just a fuss for runner's head stuck, which made it a bit lighter. And the main thing was um, like this in the, in the uh, bits after the war. The, the J.A. Presby 500cc engine was still uh, very popular, and that lasted for it's the, up to 1958, I think, and then the Jawa engine started the warming. Uh -huh. Then the four valve engines came out, and then the Japs then slowly died a natural death because the Jap delivered 45 brake horsepower from the factory, uh -huh. which you could get on the three brake horsepower is right higher than the compression ratio, but the four valve engines were giving 65 brake horsepower. What, okay, was it was it lucrative? Was there a lot of prize money? Yes. Well, I'll give you an example. In 1947, the average wage in Britain for the ordinary working man was about 12 pounds a week, and I was earning 200. So that ratio, it was pretty good. What what titles did you hold in, in the title? Well, what, what what period were you? Were I you? was racing from 1947 until 1947 till 1953. After that, I went to Italy and made a film for the Italians and tried to get the Italians organized, which is a bit of a joke, actually. But that was the last time I wrote it in Italy, in uh, Valle Lungo, just north of Rome. What was, it, what was this film about? Was it was to show the Italians what Speedway was all about because they had they were about road racing people. The Italians are all the road racing people. And they tried to get Speedway going there, but unfortunately it, uh, it wasn't really successful. They hadn't got the equipment, and finances were low, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it didn't. Uh, I spent 12 months with them and it didn't. didn't and it, it, it just died a natural death virtually. It died a natural death, it didn't get off the ground at all. So did you, what, what titles then did you hold? Well, the title, I didn't hold any titles really. I was one of those sort of chaps that, uh, I, was not an, I was not an ambitious rider. I was content to earn my money and, uh, and I, perhaps I was a bit silly in some way because the, the championship round I went, I went in for, and I won the world championship round in Glasgow one year and I should have cleaned up then. I had machine trouble that had went with it, I had all the troubles. And I was I was rather a half slope rider, but there was a cutting in the in the London press in 1947. Which I'm getting my strap, but he said these are the words. He says, "Have been watching Jeff Bennett, and I say without doubt this man will be one of England's greatest riders ever." And perhaps I didn't fulfil that. I mean, the, the ability was there, but I was, you know, I was a lazy rider. I think basically I just I earned my money. I earned enough what I wanted, and that was all I wanted. I wanted to keep on the the, the um, Glory and all that sort of thing. You obviously had to win races to get well, points. I won a lot of races, mm -hmm. yes. I won one or two trophies. I won the Plymouth Trophy. And I had to do that. I had to beat some, ride, to beat some great riders to do that. Uh, but I was never ambitious in the sense that uh, the Speedway came second. I was more than a family man. And I found that uh, having a family which was just starting, I had six children to finish 
and that was more important to me than any any speedway like that. But um, we had some fun all the same. Well, who, who would you consider the greats of the time? Well, I, I think myself that the, the greatest rider of all times was easy debatable really, but I think the man that that was a champion for as long as anybody else who was out there. He was a chap named Jack Parker, who was a Birmingham man, and he he was never world's champion. He, he was just unlucky, but he was consistently, I suppose, he, he, he was, I would say, the greatest rider of all time. There's been some great riders, I mean, the, the American. Um, It was American uh, Wilbur Lamoureux, who was a great friend of mine. I rode with Wilbur for quite a long time at Birmingham. He was one of the greats. Of course, the Cordy and Jack Milne, one was the, the well, Jack was from this world champion, or Cordy was, I forget which one was in there. Oh, and uh, I said a little bit of it. You never went to ride in America? No, I had a chance to go to Pasadena. In, uh, when Wilbur went back to the States, he wasn't quite able to have a season. I said, oh, no, I wouldn't. I was asked to go to Australia. I, I turned that down. I did go to check to the back with Bill Kitchen, the captain of Wembley. Uh, I went to re represented England over there for four days, and it was a great success. Great success, actually. Yeah, really, 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 yes, the Russians, the Poles, and the Czechs. <coughs> was it was it dangerous? Was it physically punishing? Well, no, not really. You had to, you had to be basically fit. But it was. Um, I mean, no race lasted more than about seventy-five seconds. You, you, went, you had some injuries, didn't you? Oh, I had a, yes, I was unlucky. I had a concussion once. Um, what else did I have? Then I had a compound fracture of the right leg. And no, I, I'm just... And then what else did I have? Nothing else. That was it, just one compound fracture? And then I was, and that was, uh, well, that was all caused of somebody else. It was never my fault. I was, in fact, my insurance... <coughs> There were three riders in Britain who had the, had, had, had the top class insurance. Jack Parker was one, and I was another one. I'm getting to the chap now, but we paid the lowest premiums of all because they were classified as being very safe riders. And unfortunately, these things happened to me through other fat heads. All the innings or so on and so forth. You were never <coughs> yes, I was first number one in, in any particular year? I was. Uh, when, I, when I broke my leg, uh, my average. You stay 12 points to the maximum when you, you can get in a team. Um, my average was 11.1, um, which is very really high, believe me, which is very really high. Uh, and that was uh, higher than a lot of people. In fact, I, I, I must admit, I've had, I'll give you an instance of my ability. Perhaps I shouldn't say that, but there well. The Strash final one night, that is the race where the four highest points scored from two teams. A race, a race racing and it should be the best race of the night. With well, this one particular night it was, it was Jack Parker, Graham Warren, an Australian, a great rider, Graham. Um, and who else was there? A Wilbur Lamar of the American. It's four of us and myself. And as we walked out to our bikes at the start, Graham Warren said, We only want Big Dog and now for the four best riders in the world. And in a way, he was right. I thought, well, we'll, show, we'll show you something now. And I went out and I, I did, I won the race. And uh, but this was me. I could do this sort of thing, but I wanted to. But I wasn't consistent. I wasn't, I wasn't, what's the word? I wasn't interested enough. It the, wasn't, it, it, your the heart's was the not, I was interested in the money. And I was a lot of money racing because I was consistent and I was, I was always there. And I was never interested in medals and cups and all that sort of thing. Who, who were you sponsored by? Nobody. Nobody you, had, you had no sponsors? No sponsors at all in those days. You had to do it all yourself. So you, you paid for your own... Paid for your own bikes, everything. Your own dope, your own oil, everything. Uh, that's interesting. That's interesting. That was, uh, that, was the, that was the bad old days, they say. But the point is, there's quite a lot of money in the good old days. Yeah. Uh, okay, now let's uh, change. Uh, so, so uh, what what would you, in your opinion, in your opinion, what was the best British road bike ever? British road bike. <sighs> Difficult. Depends the period you go to, I suppose. If you go pre-war, there's so many machines pre-war you couldn't you couldn't save one machine. I don't think that's before the war. What's your personal favourite? Um, well, I think. 
there's two machines that stand out post war. <coughs> That's the Triumph Ty Tiger 100 and the BSA Golden Flash, the 651. Um, which I wrote, and I wrote those quite a lot actually, and I must admit they were very, very reliable machines. Tiger 100 did 100 miles an hour. And the BSA 650, that would do about uh, just, just over 100, that would do. But they were, uh, you, could, you could do 80 miles an hour all day long, and they wouldn't, they were more 90 miles an hour, they wouldn't give you any trouble at all. But if you come to the, 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 the classics like the Northerns, the Manx Northerns, then you've got to be different to get away with a really good machine. I suppose the Norton Manx engine, I would say myself, and I've heard these Italians as well, that the single cylinder Norton was the greatest single cylinder ever built. And, and, and one more race in any sort of single cylinder. Hmm. It was surpassed with the multi cylinders, of course, but it, it held its title for so many years uh, that it was. It was. They were, they were a masterpiece of engineering. They were a beautiful machine. Everything was. Yeah. Another tragedy is to survive, of course. I'm jumping back a second. What, what, how did you end your career? What finally <coughs> brought it to a close? Well, finally, what. what uh, what finished me was, I think, lack of confidence. What happened? I had a broken leg in Ireland, uh, which was caused of some other fathead, and I was, it was a spinal fracture, a very bad fracture. I was 12 months in, in plaster and steel calipers and all sorts of things. I finally got back, and uh, I, my form was right back again. I had my first trial at Wolverhampton Speedway with uh, an old friend of mine who was the manager there, Major Wilcox. And I would equal the track record in practice, and I thought, right, I'm ready for going. And Marshall said, right, oh, Jeff, well, where we go? And I, I, my form came right back, my average was one of the highest in the country. And Birmingham met Wembley that night, a Saturday night at Birmingham. Uh, Saturday night at Birmingham, Wembley came down, and the first race of the night was Tommy Price, who was world champion, myself, Danny Dunton, I think he was, and, and, and an English chap, my partner. Um, which is maybe, uh, a bit of a wild boy, was. And uh, Price made the gate, and I was with Price, and we went down the back straight together. Price died for the line, as you we did. I died the trust of Price. Right about his front wheel, and I'd made a lovely turn, I'd cut him completely, I was coming right across him there, and suddenly my bike came up right, and I flew over the out of like a rocket hit the fence. And what had happened? Oh, Manfred was the part of my partner, a youngish chap, a bit wild, in fact very wild, and he tried to do the imposter so I come around all of us. And as I, as I threw my bike out across into the turn, he picked out his bike up in the air, threw it over the fence, which cut my tie in half and brought my bike up right through the other and hit, I hit the fence, real, real proud he was. And uh, that was it. And I was so badly shaken, I was really shaken when I came back and I sort of I don't know what it was, I seemed to lose interest. I had two or three more rides and I said to my wife, I'm going to pack it with you, I've had enough. That was the broken leg? No, no, that was, that was a 12 point half the broken leg. That was his prank, that was his prank with Price, caused by some my stupid partner. And I lost interest, complete lost interest. I went to Italy for a holiday and I came back and I said, I don't know. And I never rode again in England. You and Jimmy Clark, or you and uh, uh, Jackie Stewart? No. Quick way you're ahead. Price. Oh yeah, Tommy Price was it, he was a world champion. Oh, and I'd had enough, I thought, no, I went to Italy then, and I made a film for the Italians. I did a bit of racing, it did really, really much though. I made this film for the Italians, and that was it. I just sort of uh, started my own business. What was the business? Motorcycles. We started making frames and forks and all sorts of things. Oh, you, you built them? I mm. didn't know that. Yeah, it was to make frames and forks. It was very specialist work. Wasn't there some importing and exporting or something? Oh, we used to export bikes to America, yeah, second-hand uh, English machines. We used to do about 10 a week. Do you have any of these any of these frames, or do you know it? No, well, it's, it's been like 10 years ago, now. 30, 35 years since I, uh, 30, about 30 years since I packed up. Would, would, would you recognize, I mean, if you saw a bike with well, your frame? Well, we would, we would, we would, we would a person would come to us, they'd say, I want, a, I want a set of forks made for so and so. And this is the last, okay, what, we make them for you. Uh, we'd make, we were the first person in our place to make the first grass strap with a swinging arm frame. Uh, in what I say, we had a, we had a, a, the front end was his speedway completely, and we, we put a swinging arm back end done. It was the first bike ever used on the grass, and very successfully indeed. 
And we were the first person kicking in to do that. He was copied, he was copied and copied and copied all the way down. But it's the standard form there, of course. The swing arm was in, in the rear. In the, in the rear, yes, 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 like the modern machine guys. This was, this was uh, 1950. Uh, 53, I think it be, 58, 53 was this one. And uh, it was copying photographs as soon as it came out. Was, was it a, was it a, a regular copyrighted patent? No, what we did, we, we copied the front end of a, a speedway. We, we made a jig, thought we had a jig. We used the front section of a, a, a speedway machine, the different diamond, that part there, like there, yeah. there. And then we, we tacked, we made a swinging arm to the back of it, a light swinging arm with a light damper on. Uh, and it was a very light machine, but very successful on, on, on big circuits. It was super. It would, it would, it would just uh, it would do a different damper stretch of pressures for the... So you, so you couldn't call it totally your own because you used the, well, the square frame from a... Right? No, we didn't. Well, we, 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 it was actually, I don't know, the diamond was a, was a similar to a speed. I don't know, front stand, the diamond, it was all ours, actually. Everything was ours. But, I mean, speedway machines were, were made and covered by all everybody. I mean, people uh, made this and made that in that period just after the war with all sorts of strange designs on the track. In fact, I went to tell you, I was quoting, I was asked by Excelsior, uh, who was to make very good machines before the war, if I would drive, I wrote Excelsior in those days on the speedway, especially designed for the speedway, and they asked me if I'd like to ride a, a Vincent Comet. And they said, should I take my bike to the works? They'd put a Vincent Comet engine in my frame for me, which was on dope. Would I try it out for them? Uh, when you say dope? Well, alcohol. Oh. And so uh, I used this for two or three times. It was successful. It was a, it was a great road racing bike. In fact, Surtees, the world's champion motorcyclist, road racing and car man, you know, he, he was world champion. John. His, his father used to race his engine on the grass. Uh, uh, Coming in, in Vincent, uh, but it was that was always on the lungs of a speedway. The short stuff, it wasn't practical, it wasn't suitable, it wasn't enough initial acceleration. This would have been a speedway bike. A speedway bike, and put in my complete Excelsior. They just dropped it in the works, dropped it in there. I thought, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't as good as the old Gabby. Huh. I suppose the Jap was the most successful engine the world's ever known, really. It was designed in the 20s, and I mean, it went, went, went right the way through road, right, road, road works and, and speedway till 1950. But they didn't make a road bike. A road. Oh, yeah, they did before the war. Yeah. But most machines on the most most machines fitted the Japanese engine before the war. They made the frames and the fittings. They then they fitted a what a Brough Superior. Had a Jap. Yeah, a Jap, Jap twin. Yeah, but the, the the like the BSA Gold Star and the Norton Dominator. That no, was they were different. They were all BSAs over there. They were for AJs like they were over there. Don't need it. But I mean, uh, the, 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 a lot of people instead of designing loading, they used Jap engines. Because they were so, so efficient. But the heyday of the of the of the single uh, 500 singles, uh, the, 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 the the North and the BSA was in the more in the 50s or, uh, or, four, or late Oh 50s. yes, it was. I suppose it's it's it's, 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 it's right. when you realise in Britain in the in the in 1928s there were 600 firms involved in making motorcycles more than anybody in the world. We did the world of course. And slowly we we lead it out to the war they these fly completely it was a disaster that was a terrible disaster it's never happened. But they well, I did. I mean before the war Western Mars which is in Britain we never never heard of these things happened. You go to you go to our show in Birmingham the day with my show some shows a three war bikes that you'll never yeah. realise how big they are. So what bikes do you want now? All I've got now, I've only got three left. I've got my nineteen twenty six T T cotton with a Blackburn engine, which is the, uh, the reserve machine, which is a very rare bike indeed. It's got a flat tank, beaded edge tyres, and about 80 miles an hour. Excellent little machine for 1926. And that's the last of its kind. I've got a, a 350 M50 uh, Norton, push rod, 350 push rod model, feather bed frame, and I've got my old favourite, which I rode in the wall, the old BSA M20 500 side valve. Which I love, like it's an old plunker. Uh, you're sitting, sitting tough here, 30 miles an hour, just squeeze the throttle. He plunks the way there. Beautiful. He's highly revving over squared in his engines today. It's a nice chance to go backwards and enjoy the old long soak engine, really. Do you still ride? Oh, yeah, I still ride, though, I do, yeah. You can have a go and come over. Right, so you said something about Czechoslovakia the other day, right? <coughs> oh, yes, I went there. I went 
were actually in England with Bill Kitchen, the Wembley captain. And we had a week over there, and we had a marvellous time actually. Well, these were the days when the Reds, the Reds had taken the place over. It was a bit dicey actually. It was a bit hilarious. You know, it was a bit frightening actually because uh, you had to go by the book, and if you diverge it off your off your course, you could finish up behind bars very easily. But we had a marvellous uh, three days racing. And uh, we were very successful. Of course, it wasn't fair for these chaps because they, they, although they had English equipment, the Yap engines, it was really badly worn out. They couldn't get the spares. And uh, it, was, it wasn't really good. They, they hadn't got the competition, so obviously they don't get better. You're only as good as the opposition. And if the opposition is that good, you don't get any better. So it was interesting, though. We had a, we had a, good, we had a good time there.